and welcome to the Inf Infectious Diseases Epidemiology Seminar Series brought to you by the Center for Communicable Disease Dynamics and the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. I am Lerato Mahosi and I will be your moderator for this session. I'm excited and honored to welcome Professor Kate Grabowski as our speaker today, who is at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. First, let me introduce our speaker. Professor Grabowski's research focuses on the epidemiology, prevention, and control of HIV and sexually transmitted infections in Sub-Saharan Africa. Over the last decade, she's made major contributions to understanding the role of mobility and migration on HIV transmission dynamics, impact of HIV prevention and treatment programs on HIV outcomes, and HIV molecular epidemiology. Most of Professor Grabowski's research is nested within the Lakai Community Cohort Study, one of the largest and oldest population-based HIV cohorts worldwide. She also has broader academic interests in preprint peer review, the ethics of open data science, and the use of pathogen genomics for public health in low-income settings. Professor Grabowski's talk today is entitled the Epidemiological and Evolutionary Dynamics of HIV in Lakai, Uganda. Insights from 30 years of population-based research in Eastern Africa. Once again, please remember that you can send questions during the talk to Bradford Taylor via the chat function. Thank you very much for joining us, Professor Grabowski. Please take it away. Thank you so much. Um, let me just share my screen here. Okay, let's start from the beginning. All right, well, thank you for the amazing opportunity to speak here at the Center for Communicable Disease Dynamics and the really kind introduction. This is truly an honor. Um, on behalf of a large team at the Rakai Health Sciences Program and uh, collaborators across the globe, I'm pleased to share a large interdisciplinary body of work on the epidemiological and evolutionary dynamics of HIV. Um, the work I'll share today has been done largely through, um, has been done through 30 years and counting of longitudinal population-based surveillance research in Rakai, Uganda. And I hope uh, by the end of today's talk that you'll all leave here feeling really excited about the potential for um, po longitudinal population-based research to inform uh, pandemic response. So the objectives of today's talk are fivefold. First, I'm going to begin by centering us away from COVID and back to HIV, uh, describing the current state of the African HIV epidemic and ongoing surveillance activities on the continent, including population-based longitudinal studies. Next, I'm going to introduce the Rakai Community Cohort Study, or what we call the RCCS for short. Um, and this, the RCCS, as, as just mentioned, is among the longest running and largest population-based surveillance uh, cohorts on the African continent and globally. I'm going to spend the remainder of the talk focused on key insights into HIV transmission and control that we've gained through the RCCS, beginning with providing a brief overview of our most early findings prior to the availability of biomedical treatment and prevention. Next, I'm going to summarize modern HIV treatment and prevention activities and how we've been assessing their impact on the RCCS. And finally, I'll describe how we're using RCCS data to monitor ongoing transmission evolution of the virus on a background of declining HIV incidence. Um, so I, I know that COVID has sucked the oxygen out of the room for many communicable diseases, HIV included. Uh, but if there's one thing that I want you to take away from today's talk, it's that the HIV pandemic uh, is still ongoing and it's still raging, um, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, the virus, which emerged in the early 1980s, has been one of the deadliest pandemics in history. It has an untreated uh, case fatality rate of nearly 100%, and it's caused millions of infections and deaths since its emergence only 40 years ago. Um, today, HIV remains a devastating pandemic. In 2020, there were 37.7 million people who were living with HIV. Nearly a quarter of these people were not receiving any retroviral therapy, and there were about 680,000 people who died from, from an AIDS-related illness in 2020. Um, despite the widespread availability of HIV treatment and prevention options, including things like HIV testing, condoms, and pre-exposure prophylaxis, um, we're still seeing like well over a million people becoming newly HIV infected um, every single year. And so um, 
So the burden of HIV uh, globally is not uniformly concentrated by any means. Um, most uh, cases are in Sub-Saharan Africa with the region accounting for nearly 25 of the 37.7 million uh, cases worldwide. And within Africa, HIV uh, prevalence, which is shown here on your left and case burden on the right, uh, vary substantially across the continent. Much of Southern Africa um, has high HIV prevalence uh, with some high prevalence uh, zones. Let me just point on my pointer with some high prevalence zones um, here in the Lake Victoria region and in parts of Western Africa. Um, case burden, however, is highly concentrated within a small number of geographic uh, areas, um, most notably um, portions of Western Africa and KwaZulu-Natal, the Lake Victoria Basin, and, um, and in Western Africa, Nigeria. While Eastern and Southern Africa are home to the largest numbers of HIV cases, they've actually seen the most dramatic declines in HIV incidence and mortality over the last decade. Uh, these two figures here from UNAIDS show that new infections have uh, decreased by 43% and AIDS mortality by 50% uh, since 2010. Uh, but despite the good news, there are still challenges for HIV control in the region. In 2020 alone, there were 683,000 new HIV infections in Eastern and Southern Africa. Um, and if you compare this to uh, Europe in the same year, that was 65 times higher than what was observed in Europe. Um, also with rollout of HIV treatment and expansion of ERT guidelines, we've seen rising HIV drug resistance, particularly in the East Africa region. Um, funding for our control efforts are declining uh, with major donors calling for more targeted approaches and you can interpret that as you will. Uh, and of course, uh, we've seen major systems disruptions over the last couple of years, most notably the COVID-19 pandemic. So given the large burden of the disease and the continued challenges of HIV surveillance um, and the continued challenges that I just mentioned on the previous slide, um, HIV surveillance on the African continent really remains more important than ever. And we have really five key uh, surveillance data sources in Africa, each providing their own unique insights into disease transmission and control. Um, there is clinical and programmatic data, which is by far the biggest data source, and it largely underpins the UNAIDS curves I showed you a few slides ago. Um, there are also large national serial surveys that are conducted sporadically. Um, many of these national serial surveys um, uh, are supported by the U.S. Centers for Disease Control. You may know them as the FIA surveys. They're conducted um, out of Columbia by ICAP. And then... Um, we also um, uh, have been conducting uh, clinical trials over the last few decades. Um, some of these have been very large uh, and very expensive, but these studies have provided a wealth of information beyond their primary objective and uh, have really given us some key insights into HIV epidemic dynamics. Um, there are key population programs and studies focused on very high risk populations like sex workers and men who have sex with men. And they're also providing critical data and then last, uh, and certainly not least, are the longitudinal population-based HIV cohorts, including the Rakai Community Cohort Study. And I am obviously very biased, but these cohorts, in my opinion, have really provided some of the most critical, actionable information over the course of the pandemic and are among uh, our best data sources for understanding the rapidly changing nature of the pandemic. And so I hope over the next 35 minutes or so, I'm gonna convince you why this is the case. So I'll start with a big picture overview of why I think these longitudinal population-based studies are so critical. In short, they provide us with details and denominators. They give us fine-scale resolution data on who is acquiring and transmitting the virus at a population level. They provide longitudinal trend data on key metrics like HIV incidence and mortality. Uh, we can evaluate the impact of interventions within them, both at an individual and a population level. And because we're storing data and often samples as well, we can conduct um, really high quality nested studies, um, usually with very well matched control populations. So there are 10 or so longitudinal population based cohorts in Africa, only a handful of these studies are still actively collecting data. And among the largest of these studies still collecting data is the Rakai Community Cohort Study. The RCCS is conducted in the Rakai region of Uganda. Rakai, um, uh, you can see it here, uh, is in one of these, um, uh, is in the kind of like high burden case region in the Lake Victoria Basin. Uh, 
It is situated along the Tanzanian border on Lake Victoria, and it's transected by two major highways, including the Trans-African National Highway, which passes through to the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, where the virus uh, initially began uh, spreading out of Central Africa um, many decades ago. So why, why are we doing research in Merkai? So very early in the 1980s, there were newspapers in Uganda that were began reporting that there was a mysterious disease killing young women and men in Kosansero, which is a small fishing community along Lake Victoria in Merkai. And the reports were so alarming that it prompted a team of young African doctors led by Drs. David Sirwata and Nelson C. Wincombo to go to the region in 1981. And upon their arrival, they found hundreds of young people wasting away and experiencing absolutely horrifying deaths. They immediately began investigating the disease. And over a period of a couple of years, they were able to confirm that the causative agent was the same as that killing young MSM in the United States. And these first cases in Casancero were called uh, slim disease uh, due to the wasting that they were causing and what we now know to be the late stages of AIDS. Um, so these cases were reported in 1985 in the Lancet after a lot of snail mail back and forth between collaborators in the UK and with the journal. And like just reflecting on this timeline and the events over the last couple of years, it's really amazing to see how far we've come just in my lifetime alone uh, in terms of um, uh, investigating disease etiology and communicating scientific findings. So Dr. Sirwata and Simon Combo knew that there was a much bigger problem than these cases in Casancero. And so they immediately began a research project in the Rakai district, uh, which is now known as the Rakai Health Sciences Program today. Um, and to start this research project, they enlisted the help of Drs. Maria Wayward and Ron Gray, and the four of them are, um, are, uh, are founders of uh, the modern RCC, the modern Rakai program. So today, RHSP is a very large HIV research and service organization in South Central Uganda. It has about 700 uh, employees or so. It serves 11 districts in the region, and its central mission uh, really focuses on conducting high-quality research that improves public health um, and policy through service. The first uh, RHSP study was an HIV zero survey that was conducted in 1988 in 21 randomly selected communities along mean and secondary roads and in rural areas. And this initial population-based survey revealed extraordinarily high HIV prevalence, particularly in major roadside communities where more than half of the adult population were found to be uh, HIV infected. Um, they shortly did like a, a, a follow-up survey to measure incidence, and they found uh, astronomically high HIV incidence rates of more than three per 100 person years in the general population. So these are really, really high um, rates and, and high prevalence levels. Um, one of the major factors um, identified as being associated with HIV in this earlier Sierra survey, um, and also in other Sierra surveys that were being conducted at the time in Africa, was the association between other sexually transmitted infections and HIV. And, um, and, and uh, initially the thought was, well, if we could treat these STIs then maybe we could prevent and control HIV. So the 21 uh, surveyed communities in that initial survey were expanded to 40. And, um, and they tested uh, this hypothesis of STIs in a community randomized trial of mass presumptive STI treatment for HIV control. Um, unfortunately, the results of this uh, trial conducted in the early 90s were negative, uh, but the communities continued to be followed under the auspices of what today is the RCCS. So the modern Rakai community cohort study um, is now conducted in adults 15 and above in 34 communities. Um, these 34 communities include 30 agrarian and semi-urban trading communities um, that were in the original STD trial and are shown in the map of the surveillance area here on the right. You can see these um, uh, green triangles here are uh, rural, more agrarian communities and the yellow are larger semi-urban trading centers. In 2011, we uh, expanded surveillance to include four um, fishing communities along the Lake Victoria coast, including Casancero, which is where those um, early cases of HIV were first reported by Dr. Sawada and Simon Combo. So um, the reason that these fishing communities were not included in our earlier surveillance activities is because they were virtually impossible to reach. Um, uh, there were no roads going down there. And then in the mid 2000s, there was this kind of massive explosion of the fishing industry. 
uh, as Europeans became very enthusiastic about eating Nile perch and tilapia. And so roads were built and we could access those communities and begin doing surveillance. So today the RCCI surveys approximately 20,000 study participants every 1.5 to two years in an open cohort. And we have had more than 300,000 individuals participate in the study and contribute more than a million bio uh, specimens to our repository. So each uh, RCCS survey begins with a population census that documents all household members, in migrations, out migrations, and deaths. We also collect information on household assets. Uh, the census is then followed by a survey, um, which includes community residents who are age eligible and capable of providing informed consent. We collect all kinds of data during the survey, including demographics, sexual behavior, health service utilization data. Um, we've embedded various questions over the years um, as part of uh, various R01 uh, studies. And as part of um, the survey, we obtain uh, biospecimens um, for HIV testing and also for storage for future studies. All of our participants are linked to um, HIV services in some capacity, including to HIV treatment for those who are HIV positive. So the data that we collect through the RCCS allows for all kinds of studies, um, uh, including uh, cross-sectional and longitudinal studies of individuals. We also, um, as part of the survey, link cohabitating sexual partners. And so we can do couple studies. And, and these studies have really proved um, especially useful for understanding uh, uh, factors associated with onward transmission. Um, in addition, we collect uh, egocentric network data. We ask people about their four most recent uh, sexual partners. Um, we have nested studies on population trends um, for key uh, uh, disease metrics like HIV incidence. Um, we've nested randomized trials in the RCCS. We've done molecular epidemiology and using um, our repository, we've uh, conducted a lot of basic uh, laboratory research. So with that brief introduction and overview of the RCCS, um, we can now start talking about some of the key findings that the study has produced. Um, I'm gonna do really what is a very brief overview of our most critical early uh, findings uh, from the RCCS in my view. So you remember that the early STD trial that I just mentioned um, and how unfortunately control of sexually transmitted infections did not reduce HIV incidence. Um, despite the study uh, being negative, it produced an enormous wealth of data and information um, that informed our basic understanding of HIV transmission. And uh, the negative findings really challenged folks to start thinking very deeply about what it was that was driving incidents if it wasn't sexually transmitted infections. So one of the very first hypotheses that were tested was that um, HIV uh, viral load was associated with transmission. And then probably what is one of the most um, important papers on HIV over the course of the entire pandemic, uh, Tom Quinn and David Swada and other colleagues from the Rakai program showed that higher viral loads were associated with higher transmission uh, within serodiscordant couples in the RCCS. And they, this was a retrospective analysis. Um, most uh, importantly, they found that there were zero cases of transmission um, and a small number of couples where the positive partner had a viral load of less than 400 uh, copies per ml. Um, shortly thereafter, uh, Marie Weyer and Ron Gray uh, reported on associations between, um, between stage of transmission and HIV incidence. So they found that um, in the very early stages of uh, infection, there were higher uh, levels of transmission from the positive partner uh, to the negative partner, and then in the late stages of transmission. And we now know that um, in uh, following acute infection, we see an increase in viral uh, load, uh, which is driving this association. And in the late stages of infection, we also see an uh, increase in viral load, which is driving uh, the, this late stage uh, infection association. So these, um, these findings were the genesis of what was the HP10052 clinical trial that showed early uh, HIV treatment uh, can effectively uh, prevent transmission. And it's now the basic uh, basis of the recommendation to treat all people uh, with HIV regardless of stage of infection. Um, so very clear and high impact, uh, high impact policy implications from this early research. Um, in addition to finding that viral load was associated with onward transmission in the uh, STI trial, um, data from, from the trial also showed that, lower, that there was lower HIV incidence in circumcised men regardless of the viral load in their uh, positive female partner. 
And this led to the hypothesis that voluntary male circum voluntary medical male circumcision could uh, reduce male HIV acquisition, um, which was subsequently tested in a randomized clinical trial uh, that recruited RCCS um, cohort participants. And the trial found that uh, individual male HIV risk was reduced by 51% uh, with VMMC. So the, this clinical trial, in addition to two other RCTs, of VMMC in Africa led to the WHO recommendation for voluntary medical male circumcision for HIV prevention. Uh, so our two main biomedical interventions today in Sub-Saharan Africa are antiretroviral therapy and voluntary medical male circumcision. And both of these followed from uh, early observations in the Rakai Community Cohort Study. So in addition to viral load, male circumcision stage of infection, um, other factors, uh, in the RCCS were identified as being linked to HIV transmission, um, uh, most notably, uh, I think, as HIV subtype. So in Rakai, there are two major uh, HIV-1 group M subtypes that circulate, HIV subtypes A and D. Um, and in this 2009 subtype uh, uh, study, Noah Kiwanuka showed that subtype A viruses uh, were much more transmissible than subtype D viruses. Um, in a subsequent study, he further showed that subtype D viruses were associated with substantial excess loss of CD4 T cells and faster disease progression. So uh, subtype A was more transmissible and subtype D more pathogenic. And we'll come back to this at the end of the, the talk today. So um, following on uh, uh, observations of viral load and couples, um, Oliver Leyendecker in collaboration with Deirdre Hollingsworth and Christoph Frazier, um, began looking at set point viral load in couples. And set point viral load, for those of you who don't know, is the kind of steady state viral load um, of people in the chronic stages of infection. And it varies from individual to individual. So some people, some people can have very high set point viral loads and some people can have very low set point viral loads. And the higher your set point viral load, the more likely you are to progress um, uh, uh, to, to AIDS um, more quickly. And so in this, um, uh, in an examination of, of uh, epidemiologically linked couples in the RCCS and genetically linked couples, um, they were able to show that um, couples tended to share similar viruses such that um, viral load was a heritable uh, trait. So just a key, uh, a summary of our key early findings. Um, uh, uh, observations from the RCCS revealed that HIV viral load is the greatest risk factor for onward transmission. Stage of infection was also linked to higher risk of onward transmission. Um, we observed lower uh, risk of HIV acquisition with male circumcision, um, which led to the finding that voluntary medical male circumcision reduces risk by 50%. Um, and we observed that viral factors are associated with both transmission and pathogenicity. So that was the early days. So what's been uh, the state of the HIV epidemic in Rakai more recently? So this figure here shows HIV prevalence by age and gender in the RCCS. Um, these were the baseline uh, seroprevalence data from Lake Victoria fishing communities, which you'll recall were added to our cohort in 2011. Uh, the fishing communities are shown here in blue, um, the semi-urban trading centers in yellow, and the uh, rural agrarian communities in green. Um, and you can see like across the board, HIV prevalence is high in all these communities, but, um, but the prevalence in the fishing communities um, uh, had seroprevalence levels um, unlike anything we had seen in recent times, um, with seroprevalence peaking at about 60% among women 35 to 49, and just over 40% among men 30 to 34 years old. Um, overall, uh, seroprevalence is higher among women than men, which is very typical of African uh, uh, epidemics where um, uh, most infected people are women. So, Despite this really high prevalence in the RCCS, there's been um, very serious efforts to reduce HIV transmission in Rakai and elsewhere across the African continent. So in the following section, I'm going to just give a brief summary of our HIV control activities, uh, which are representative of most other HIV control efforts in the region, and I'm going to share some results from our impact assessments. So here you can see an abbreviated timeline of HIV service rollout in Rakai, beginning with prevention of mother-to-child transmission services in 2001. Uh, in 2004, ART was made available to the sickest patients, so those with CD4 counts less than 200 cells per microliter. This is a full uh, eight years, by the way, after these drugs were first provided to AIDS patients here in the US. And so there were millions of people who died in the interim um, between drugs being available in the US and finally coming to Africa where um, most HIV infections were occurring. Um, so 
By 2011, uh, following the conclusion of the three randomized trials of voluntary medical male circumcision, uh, voluntary medical male circumcision started rolling out and there were also um, more liberal criteria for ART initiation. Um, following HPTN 052 in 2016, um, there was uh, the recommendation for universal HIV test and treat irrespective of CD4 count. And then in 2018, um, we started rolling out PrEP um, to selected high-risk populations. I'm not gonna talk too much about PrEP today, only to share that like um, the results um, from oral PrEP rollout have been, have been kind of disappointing and, um, and hasn't been super successful. So um, I would be remiss without mentioning that all of the service provision has really largely been supported through the President's Emergency um, AIDS Plan for AIDS Relief or PEPFAR, uh, which was started under George Bush's administration. So say what you will about his presidency, but uh, PEPFAR has saved millions of lives and um, supports uh, almost 20 million people on HIV treatment today. Earlier, I told you that the RHSP was a research and service organization. Well, RHSP is, uh, in fact, one of five PEPFAR implementers in Uganda and oversees a number of HIV programs in the Masaka region in South Central Uganda. Many, but not all of these programs are listed here. Um, the work is led by Drs. Gertrude Nakagozi and Godfrey Kagozi, who are not only phenomenal program administrators, but also researchers and also researchers themselves. So, so in Rakai, research is really very tightly linked to the program work that we do. Um, here is a map of the RHSP Masaka Regional Program, which includes um, about uh, 200 health facilities uh, with greater than 120,000 patients on ART. So we've been using RCCS data to monitor impact of these PEPFAR programs. And in 2017, we reported on incidents of HIV following ART and BMMC program rollout in our 30 continuously surveyed agrarian and trading communities um, with more moderate HIV prevalence. And in the far left um, here, you can uh, see that ART coverage kind of rapidly increase um, with ART availability and expanding ART eligibility guidelines. And then along with that ART coverage, we saw um, uh, huge increases in HIV viral load suppression. Over the same time frame, um, uh, voluntary medical uh, male circumcision uh, coverage began rapidly increasing um, uh, from 14% pre-VMMC uh, program to 60% um, by the end of our surveillance period. And with these increases in ART and VMMC coverage, we saw significant declines in HIV incidence among women and men, um, which you can see here, um, the incidence in blue uh, declining uh, over time after a period of very steady incidence. Um, declines were more rapid in men who were experiencing uh, the indirect benefits of ART um, and their female partners and the direct benefits of voluntary medical male circumcision. So what about these high prevalence like Victoria fishing communities? Well, at the, the baseline survey um, in these communities, one thing that immediately became apparent was that these communities had um, significantly lower levels of antiretroviral therapy coverage, which is here on the y-axis, and male circumcision coverage, which is here on the x-axis. Um, and so, uh, so shortly after that survey, we immediately began uh, scaling up uh, treatment and prevention in those communities. Uh, within a period of five years, we went to ART coverage levels of 15% um, all the way up to more than 80%. Uh, today, it's actually closer to 90%. Um, viral load suppression also increased, BMMC coverage increased, and we saw very rapid declines in HIV incidence with program rollout in these settings as well. Um, so you may be thinking that the trends we're seeing in Rakai are unique, like this is an awesome program, these people know what they're doing, um, but uh, the, uh, the trends are not unique. So um, uh, we recently reviewed empiric HIV incidence data published after 2010. Uh, this work was led by one of uh, our research analysts at the time, and who's now one of your own uh, here uh, at Harvard, Kay Joshi. And in this review, we found uh, HIV incidence declines were occurring across the board in Sub-Saharan Africa as treatment and prevention um, interventions became available. So in addition to monitoring uh, the population uh, trends, we've been looking at transmission risk at the couple level and uh, individual risk of HIV acquisition. In this 2011 study, we reported no observed HIV transmission in couples where the partner was on suppressive ART. We're currently working on updating this analysis with one of our uh, new doctoral students. More recently, um, we reported on the effectiveness of voluntary medical male circumcision uh, programs supported by PEPFAR. Um, we used RCCS data to follow initially uncircumcised men in the RCCS following program rollout. 
And then we compared um, HIV incidents in men who had been newly circumcised um, and uh, to incidents in men who remained uncircumcised. Um, and in this effectiveness study, we observed a 53% reduced risk of HIV acquisition among circumcised men. And this um, risk of acquisition was sustained with years, uh, many years um, from surgery. Um, so this, this is like right on target that we saw in the earlier clinical trial that I mentioned. Um, one of the more frequent questions we get is what is the relative impact of ART and DMMC? Um, we're currently working with a team at the Institute for Disease Modeling in Seattle led by Adam Akulian uh, to tease out the independent effects of these programs. And while uh, this is a work in progress, preliminary data suggests that both ART and DMMC are having about equal impact. And we are seeing um, now uh, indirect uh, impact of voluntary medical male circumcision uh, on, on female uh, HIV uh, risk, um, and it's probably accounted for about 20% of reduction in HIV incidence um, among women. We've also observed other high impact benefits of ART rollout beyond HIV incidence decline. So um, using RCCS census data, we've demonstrated substantial declines in HIV mortality over time. And we've also seen declines in orphanhood over the same time frame, which is clearly related to mortality. Um, in 1994, single and double orphanhood among adolescents in our cohort 15 to uh, 19 years old was 52%. Um, and with ART rollout, that's more than halved. So, um, so just a, a brief summary of our findings on HIV uh, uh, interventions. There's been substantial increases in coverage of antiretroviral therapy and involuntary, involuntary medical male circumcision, largely supported through PEPFAR since 2004. And these interventions have led to declines in HIV and HIV mortality in both moderate and high-risk populations. Um, both interventions are contributing to declines in HIV incidence. And then um, we're also seeing um, impacts of ART more broadly on things like declining orphanhood. So this uh, figure here shows so some of our more recent data like I'm collected immediately pre-COVID. And in 2019, uh, 2018, we were down to an instance rate of about 0.42 per 100 person years. And so that's pretty good, uh, but this rate is still really high. So for reference, it is 33 times higher than that in the United States. So we still have a lot of uh, incidents um, in these settings and a long way to go. So in the final portion of this talk, I'm just gonna give a, a brief um, overview about the research we've been doing, taking a deep look at the epidemiological and evolutionary dynamics of, the, of HIV and the RCCS. And our dynamics uh, research over the last few years has really focused on um, the following major areas and um, has started with trying to take a deep dive into sources of uh, transmission at very local levels. So in 2014, we did a, a detailed spatial analysis of the HIV epidemic in Rakai's agrarian and trading communities using um, a multi-pronged approach, including phylogenetics, spatial clustering, and, um, and models of our egocentric uh, partner network data. Um, in the phylogenetic analysis, um, we observed that while HIV viruses were typically very similar um, in partners who were living in the same household, um, if you looked within communities, um, uh, and you can see the genetic pairwise distances down here, um, and uh, all these different colors represent different regions, um, within communities, um, uh, the HIV epidemic is, is really, really very diverse. There are many circulating strains in individual communities. Um, we observe very few uh, phylogenetic clusters outside of households. And this, um, this phy phylogenetics like, really stands in contrast to what we see among MSM in either um, Europe or here in the United States where we tend to see large clusters of um, acute uh, transmission chains. We just don't see that in these settings. So when we looked at the spatial relationship between uh, cases, we observed strong uh, clustering between HIV positive cases in the household, which is consistent with our phylogenetic data. Um, but we have observed virtually no uh, clustering of cases outside the household within communities, um, indicating really a very diffuse uh, epidemic. Um, and then when we started looking at the location of, of where partners were as reported on the egocentric partner blocks um, and then related that to HIV incidents, um, what we found was that a large fraction of our cases are from uh, transmission between household partners. 
But outside the household, uh, most of our transmissions were actually coming from uh, extra community sources. And together, these three um, pieces of data were telling us that there was a lot of virus being like repeatedly introduced into communities um, and uh, generating many, many transmission chains, sort of tons of introductions into communities. And, and women in particular in the study had a really high risk of transmission from extra community partners. So at the same time that we were completing this study, we were getting that baseline HIV prevalence data back from the fishing communities. And we started to wonder whether or not these high prevalence zones could be responsible for these repeated introductions into agrarian and trading communities. So to answer this question, um, uh, um, we uh, again uh, did like a very multi-pronged approach using phylogenetics and, um, and, and partner data and, and uh, epidemiological data. And um, I'll, I'll say that um, like, it seems obvious like, oh yeah, surely these hotspots are driving transmission in these lower prevalence areas. But, um, but in fact, these fishing communities are really quite small. They have high prevalence, but they have a pretty low case burden because they're not very populated. So we wanted to answer the question whether or not these sort of like low um, case burden but high prevalence areas were driving transmission here in the inland epidemic, which is much more patchy in terms of its prevalence. And, um, and, and we were hoping that this um, answering this question might help us to target our, our limited resources. Um, and so even though the question wasn't really obvious to us as to whether or not these fishing communities were seeing the epidemic, it didn't stop the popular media um, from highly stigmatizing these Lake Victoria fishing communities as sources of transmission. Um, even in public health programs, these populations were viewed as drivers of the, of the epidemic in absence of, of any data. Um, and, and this view uh, prompted, um, along with a high case burden, really prompted um, test and treat um, very early on in these Lake Victoria fishing communities. So to answer the question about whether fishing communities were acting as sources of spread, um, we um, have been using uh, phylogenetic, epidemiologic, and even anthropologic data sources. Um, the phylogenetic work on this particular question and many of the other molecular epi studies we're doing today is done in partnership with the Pangea HIV Consortium. So Pangea HIV is a Pan-African sequencing initiative that includes cohorts and clinical trials across the continent. It's led by um, Christoph Fraser uh, out of Oxford. Um, and this study has generated more than 30,000 uh, full-length viral genomes using deep sequence approaches, and also a number of software programs um, used to analyze these data for epidemiological purposes, including PhiloScanner, um, which reconstructs directed HIV transmission networks um, from deep sequence phylogenetic data. And we have been applying uh, PhiloScanner in particular to deep sequence data generated through Pangea and the RCCS um, using uh, custom value, uh, cutoff values as determined from um, detailed analysis of epidemiologically linked cohort couples in our cohort. Um, we validated this approach um, and we've also published on, on the ethics of using these kind of approaches for epidemiological purposes. So getting to the question on hand, what is the role of these fishing communities and hotspots in Rakhai? Well, um, uh, uh, using our deep sequence data and um, linking it with some migration uh, data in the RCCS, um, what we found was that, uh, in fact, the inland and Lake Victoria fishing communities are really very isolated from one another. Like we find very few um, uh, chains that kind of cross these community boundaries. Um, and, uh, and here in these figures, what you can see are reconstructed uh, transmission events. Um, and, there, and in the few transmission events where we were observing cross-community transmission from fishing communities to the inland epidemic and from the inland epidemic to the fishing communities, what we found was that the net flow of infection um, was actually 2.5 times greater from inland to fishing areas uh, than vice versa. And so really these uh, fishing communities were looking like sources or sinks rather than sources of transmission. Um, we also started examining our migration data, um, and uh, when we did that, we found that migrants who were moving into these communities on the coast uh, tended to have very high prevalence, um, regardless of where they're coming from. So this map here, each of these red arrows indicates a migrant population moving in from a different location. I mean, you can see bright red arrows from all over the place kind of coming into these communities. Um, and this uh, suggested to us that there was actually preferential migration of HIV positive people coming into these communities, which was uh, driving uh, these dynamics. And we've been able to actually uh, confirm this uh, with on the ground anthropological data over the last couple of years.
So one of the side observations that uh, came from this analysis was that men, and in particular non-mobile men, um, in both our fishing communities, but also in our inland communities, were, dispropor were disproportionately uh, acting as sources of HIV transmission as compared to women. Uh, so we've been uh, taking a really deep dive into age and gender specific transmission patterns in the RCCS recently, following up on this observation. Um, and we've been using various uh, approaches to doing this, including deep sequence phylogenetics. So this figure here shows the mean viral load among all HIV positive persons in our cohort on the left and among only those who have unsuppressed viral load on the, on the right. And in green um, or in teal, we have men, and in red, we have women. And you can see like young men in particular um, tend to have um, uh, much higher viral loads than women. And even among um, unsuppressed men and women, we see higher viral loads among men. Um, so um, we've been using those uh, directed transmission networks that I showed you earlier to look at transmission from men to women um, as function of um, uh, the age of the uh, male source and of the female source. So if we look at incident female infections, we can see that men really between the ages of 25 and 35 are driving most of our new cases and uh, women just uh, slightly younger than those men between the ages of 24 and 29 are driving um, most of our new infections in men. Um, we've also been taking a closer look at women because they just have much higher prevalence than men and they're focus of a lot of our, our PEP4 program interventions right now. And if we look at young women in particular, we see that um, men who are much older than them um, are almost exclusively driving infection. But as women age, um, men who are either the same age as them or who are much older um, start to be driving um, most of the infections. And that's because most of the transmission is really concentrated in that 25 to 34 year old male age range, irrespective of the age of the female incident case. Um, so we've also been looking at um, disparities, uh, looking at the HIV care cascade and subpopulation. So the care cascade just follows people from the time they're diagnosed all the way to the time they're um, uh, suppressed. Um, again, we see men just have much lower uh, levels of viral load suppression as well as young people. Um, but in an in interesting analysis to, done by one of our formal doctoral students, we also found that individuals who are recently moving into our study communities also tended to have much lower viral load suppression levels. And, um, and we've started digging into the migrant population a little bit more. We've also found that this group um, has been having um, higher HIV incidence in our resident population, and it has not declined um, with the rollout of combination HIV prevention interventions. And um, in a study that was led by one of my former master's students, Jen Brophy, she found that a lot of what is driving this high HIV incidence among mobile populations in our setting is that they are preferentially um, selecting partners who tend to not be on um, antiretroviral therapy. So again, there's this uh, interesting assortative mixing happening. Um, we've also been taking a look at HIV incidence and viral load suppression levels by a person's occupation in the RCCS. Um, this is a, a study that's being led by one of my doctoral students now. Um, and um, he has found that female bark workers who have had um, very historically high HIV prevalence of around 40% in our general um, cohort communities um, uh, have uh, really had no declines in HIV incidence despite declining untreated HIV prevalence in the last decade. So this is a really um, important group that we're trying to focus on a little bit more with prevention right now. So I just wanna quickly mention that we've also been looking at durable viral load suppression, loss of suppression and persistent viremia in our cohort. It's really only been five years since um, we put everybody who's HIV positive onto lifelong oral medications. And I think it's a natural question to wonder whether or not people can persist on these medications for long periods of time without stopping or interrupting treatment. Um, the good news is that we find high levels of viral suppression, low levels of loss of suppression, but there are a subgroup of people who are persistently viremic uh, for whatever reason. And so we currently have an R01 grant that's really taking a deep dive into the uh, different sources of viremia. And we're using a lot of mixed methods approaches, including viral phylogenetics, to see which of these groups are really driving most of our new cases. So I'm just going to close out by, by getting back to the virus itself. Um, you'll remember that HIV1 subtype D and A infections are common in our cohort communities. Um, we have been looking at changes in subtype distribution. Um, and, uh, and over the last decade, what we've seen is this huge decline in subtype D infections, which are a more pathogenic virus, 
while we've seen an increase in subtype A infections, uh, which are our more transmissible virus. And, um, and in addition to this, we've also been seeing declines um, in HIV set point viral load among our HIV uh, incident cases who are untreated. Um, and so um, uh, this, this set point viral load has been steadily declining. And in this um, eLife paper we published with Christophe Frazier and Francois uh, Blancard in 2016, uh, we estimated that uh, these intrinsic changes in the virus itself may actually be uh, accounting for really large fractions of the incident declines uh, that I showed you earlier in those population level trends. Um, so just a summary of these findings, we find a lot of household transmission, um, but outside the household, uh, we observe many transmission chains with limited clustering of cases. Our hotspots seem to function more as sinks rather than sources, and it's linked to preferential migration. Um, young men between 25 and 34 have very high levels of unsuppressed HIV and are linked to a large proportion of infections in women. Um, there are identifiable uh, disparities in HIV treatment and prevention and coverage, and these are linked to um, ongoing transmission. And there are, of course, changes uh, of the virus itself occurring in the background, and these may be partly driving the declines and in incidents that we observe. Um, so I just want to say that like, there is a lot of stuff that's happening over the last couple of years that could change everything that we're seeing. Um, I mentioned uh, very briefly that um, uh, drug resistance is increasing. We see this in the Rakai community cohort study as well. Um, in 2019, there's been a new therapy, uh, dalutegravir, that's been rolled out that's supposed to kind of curb the, the tide on this, and we'll see what happens. Um, COVID happened, um, which interrupted um, mostly HIV treatment and prevention services. We still um, are seeing pretty good levels of viral suppression. Um, targeted HIV testing um, uh, uh, has been implemented in 2020, meaning we're not testing as many people as we used to, um, and the impacts of that are unclear. And, and we're getting ready to roll out new, very highly efficacious interventions soon. So stay tuned uh, for what happens next. Um, because I think there are going to be big changes happening over the next few years. Um, so big summary conclusions before I end. Um, I hope I've convinced you that the HIV pandemic is still ongoing and rapidly evolving. Um, we've seen HIV incidence declines in Eastern and Southern Africa, but rates really remain very, very high. Um, you can see that HIV programs are scalable and working, um, uh, even in the most uh, high Im highly impacted communities like fishing communities along Lake Victoria. Um, but disparities continue to drive uh, transmission and intrinsic changes in the virus may be responsible for some of the observed changes in epidemic dynamics that we're seeing. Um, and lastly, I hope I've convinced you that these longitudinal population-based surveillance efforts really have played a pivotal role in forming virus control efforts and improving population health. Um, so many acknowledgements and I'll just leave this on the, the uh, screen and uh, I'm happy to take any questions. So thanks again for having me here today. Uh, thank you, Kate, for a terrific talk. Um, we'll take questions now. We'll try our best to accommodate as many questions as we can. However, if your question doesn't get covered, please feel free to reach out, reach out to our speaker directly. Do remember to submit your questions to Bradford via the chat function or let us know and we can unmute you so that you can ask the question yourself. Our first question is from Mary, and she asks, what are the reasons that HIV incidence in women is markedly higher than men? Um, that's a great question. And uh, I think the short answer is that we really don't know. So this has been the, the, the topic of my K, uh, um, uh, and I, I'm still not convinced we really know the answers, but I do, um, I do think um, some evidence from, from our study, as well as some emerging evidence from Pangea, seems to suggest that just men are, are much more likely um, to transmit to women. Um, uh, I think for a few reasons, I think one, they tend to have more partners um, and they also have higher viral loads. And so, um, so I think it's a combination of those two things, but we haven't really teased out the reason for that. I think it's one of the biggest unanswered questions. And I think like a blockbuster science paper would be uh, teasing that all out in my opinion. So, um, so we're working on that question now along with 
some others, but I, I do think, um, yeah, I do think it's some combination of like the, their contact uh, patterns as well as their higher viral loads that are really driving the higher incidence in women. Um, also men, um, you know, they're, they're less likely to be on treatment, um, driving their, uh, partially driving uh, the fact that they have higher viral loads. So there's a, there's a number of different reasons, I think, um, yet to be fully elucidated. Our next question is from Mark Lipsich, if he'd like to unmute himself. Thank you. Thanks, Kate, for an amazing talk about the, really a great tour of what's possible and also what remains to be done. Um, gave me a much better sense of history than I've ever had, so thank you. Um, the, the question is just the, um, the one about the subtype A versus D, and mm -hmm. I may have missed it, but given the, the usual idea that it, that more pathogenic and is associated with higher transmission um, is through higher viral load, is it, is it just a matter that the, the longer duration compensates for that uh, in this case? Or? For, sub, for subtype A, seemingly outcompeting subtype yeah. B? Yeah, yeah. Um. I think so, but it's not entirely clear. So we've been like, um, so like, so what I think is happening actually, so we've been doing some work with a postdoctoral fellow and I, I didn't, um, it's not like quite ready uh, to share yet, um, but we've been taking all the molecular epi data we've been collecting over the last like 30 years or so. And then looking at like where sources of new diagnoses are, are coming from on these chains. And what we're finding is like, like, like HIV incidents and in, among subtype D infections are like kind of dying out. Um, they tend to be like, they're like the subtype D infections are like what I would consider like our local um, subtype that circulates and there are much larger chains in, in subtype D. And over the last like, like five to 10 years, we've seen like a, a huge decline and, and these large subtype D clusters that we've seen earlier on. And then we're seeing like a lot more introductions um, that are driving like new diagnoses in the region. And there are largely appear to be subtype A infections that are coming in um, from the North and coming down. So I like, it's not totally clear to me that it's like the increased transmissibility that's driving it more so than like, kind of like us kind of like kind of locally kind of like extinguishing these transmission chains and then subtype A like kind of percolating down from the north. Does that make, does that make sense? Um, so, so yeah, so I, I think like a, I think we haven't really like kind of formally investigated this yet and it's definitely something that's on the agenda, but I'm not, I'm not entirely, entirely sure, but that is a good hypothesis. Thanks. Our next question is from Bradford. Cool. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. So I have a question that's related to the male circumcision and with regards to, um, I was kind of intrigued by the dynamics over time and in terms of the benefit um, following, you know, years after um, getting a circumcision. Uh, so I was guess kind of mechanistically, what do you think is driving some of those dynamics? And I want to kind of couch this question with um, uh, within the context of as male circumcision becomes more of a choice and whether or not there's sort of selection bias associated with um, uh, maybe behavioral differences between those who choose to get a circumcision and not. Yeah, so I mean, so that's a, so that's a great question. When we were doing those effectiveness studies, like that's a, definitely um, one of the things we're most worried about is that um, men who are opting in for circumcision just tend to be less risky um, than the men who are not. And maybe that's driving some of the association. Um, uh, you know, we, we've, um, we've kind of explored this a lot and, and we've been able to do various analyses. And, and I think like the short answer is, yeah, the men who are choosing to get circumcised definitely tend to be younger. They tend to be a little bit less risky. And so I think that's part of that. So we were able to control for that to some extent um, and the effectiveness study that I, I did show you, but I, I will say there's been like a lot of mechanistic research looking at like what the reason um, is for, for um, the effectiveness of voluntary medical male circumcision. Um, we've, we've done detailed examinations of foreskin and characterized the biology and found 
um, like high burden of like target, um, rich HIV target cells um, in the foreskin of those tissues. Um, and, and again, like this was studied in a, in a randomized clinical trial um, along with two other randomized clinical trials. So this is definitely, um, definitely an intervention that, that works. Um, I was recently like outraged by a New York Times article I read because they said um, something like the hypothesized benefit of voluntary medical male circumcision. Like no one would say like the COVID vaccine is, is, has hypothesized benefit. Like we've done clinical trials of it. We've done clinical trials of voluntary medical male circumcision. Um, uh, I mean, it's, a, it's definitely a choice, but I think it's hard to argue that um, the benefits for HIV acquisition are not there. I mean, the data are just, um, are really, really robust across many observational studies and randomized control trials. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, I have two questions. Mm -hmm. uh, first question is, in the original Rakai cohort, there were 40 communities, but in the modern cohort, you've only got 34. Uh, that's because um, we are, <laughs> we only have so much money. So, um, so like you'll read a lot of our papers and the, the numbers of the communities tend to shift over time. Um, and that is because like, we've had a lot of money at some point. So we've been able to have more communities. Um, and then we um, have had, uh, you know, less money at other points like now. Um, and so we've, we've uh, kind of like uh, had to cut communities. So we recently, as of round 20, just cut six of our uh, 40 communities, which is where we get the, the 34 from. Um, and we've focused more on expanding like the age criteria of our cohort because the epidemic is aging. And um, we have some, some really cool uh, ongoing studies um, uh, looking at non-communicable diseases in HIV positive patients. So right now we're like, we, we have a study where we're following up people as they migrate out into highly polluted uh, urban areas, including Kampala. And then we're looking uh, to see um, how their cardiovascular risk factors uh, uh, change as they move into these highly polluted environments and comparing that with rural migrant controls and people who stay behind. Um, so we wanted to do those studies. So we, we've cut our communities um, and, and consolidated our funds. So that's um, the short answer is just like logistics and administration. Yeah. Thanks for the question. And the second question is, it's from what we've learned from the phylogenetics, how has policy changed for Akai and Uganda? So that's a, that's a really, I mean, that's a really good question. I would say it, uh, the, the phylogenetics um, has not yet changed policy. I think um, I think some of the the information that we're producing on age. Um, and, and, and changes of dynamics by age um, has the potential to, to potentially change policy in the near future. Um, so one of the, the big programs um, that CDC has rolled out and some of you may be familiar with is the DREAMS program. This is um, Debbie Burks's initiative focused on very young women, um, typically between the ages of 15 and 24. Um, and some analyses we're working on now with Ollie Ratman and some folks in Pangea, um, what we're seeing is like a shifting um, a, a burden of, of disease into older age groups as the, as the pandemic um, declines. And so um, what we're hoping is that um, some of these phylogenetic uh, data um, will, um, will potentially um, impact policy on that front and sort of change the age focus a little bit for some of these programs. Um, in terms of fishing communities, I mean, like the, the ART eligibility guidelines expanded for everybody, so there wasn't much policy to change there. Um, but I do hope that um, the data have like, uh, have helped to destigmatize de um, these populations a bit. Um, I think we often think as phylogenetics and being used to potentially criminalize populations and stigmatize them. But this is one of those really kind of like unique and exciting examples where like a highly stigmatized stigmatized population, um, you know, was, was um, actually found to not be a source of transmission. So I think there's a lot of power um, in these tools uh, to change how we think about the epidemic and to kind of turn hypotheses on their heads um, when they've been the dominant narrative, even for a long time. So really powerful tools. Um, and I hope that they change policy more um, as we move forward. I think COVID's like set a really good example for how they might be able to do that. And our last question 
is from Joseph Clark. He asks, how hopeful are you for more equitable access to pathogen genomics technologies in low income settings in the future? What's required in order to encourage improved geographic distribution moving forward? Uh, I, I mean, I'm, I'm very hopeful. I mean, just, just thinking about uh, um, COVID, I mean, South Africa has really been leading the way um, uh, in, in our genomic surveillance efforts. They're like, maybe like second only to the UK and uh, the work that they're doing. Um, uh, over the last like few years, there's been pathogen genomic uh, surveillance networks set up all across the, the African continent. Um, I still think, you know, we have a ways to go. I think the bigger, the biggest deficit um, area of deficit, in my opinion, is like on the bioinformatics side. And so I think we really need to be um, training uh, folks up to do the analyses. We need to also be providing the, the, the network, uh, computer network and bioinformatic infrastructure to be able to do these kind of analyses on the ground. Um, and so um, I'm, I'm really hopeful. There's a lot of movement in this area. Bill and Melinda Gates has like really been instrumental in, in funding a lot of this work and pushing this forward. Um, Africa CDC has been, has been amazing on this front. And so I think there's big things, big things to come. Um, for HIV, I think, you know, there's still, there's still a long ways to go. Like we're not doing, um, routine HIV drug resistance testing. Um, you know, we're not doing, you know, viral loads are pretty infrequent, um, compared to what they are here in the United States and Europe. Um, there's some really new, exciting technologies, um, folks in, uh, our Pangea consortium are testing, um, to be able to integrate, um, genomic surveillance and viral load testing, um, in more of a point of care fashion. And so it'll be exciting to see where that stuff moves forward. And I'm hoping that the archive site would be a really good opportunity to test some of that, um, some of that new technology out. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your awesome work. Thanks. And it was great. On behalf of the Center for Communicable Disease Dynamics and the Harvard TH Chan School of Public Health, let's thank Professor Grabowski again for joining us today and for a fantastic talk and discussion. Please do get in touch with any of the seminar organizers if you've got questions for us or our speaker. Also check out the Center for Communicable Disease Dynamics website to stay up to date on upcoming seminars and other events. Next week's seminar will be given by Professor Vanessa Ezenra from Yale, and she'll be talking about Hellman's microbe co-infection, insights from a natural system. Thank you again, everyone, for joining. Goodbye. Bye, thank you.